If you have your Bible with you, you can open it to Philippians 4. We're talking this weekend about the attitude of gratitude, something that God's been speaking to me about, and I think uh, wanting me to speak to you about as well. And this is the very end of a book that Paul wrote from a Roman prison. We're going to be drilling down on this subject of gratitude, thankfulness, joy, uh, having a positive mental attitude, seeing the glass half full uh, instead of half empty. And Paul writes in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That is a lot of power at your disposal. To rejoice always, uh, to be anxious never, to pray always, uh, to feel alone never. Uh, to be appreciative always, to be despondent never. That is a tremendous power, the power of gratitude. And you can actually flip the switch uh, in your own life. The Bible says you get to choose. You get to choose your emotion. Philippians 4.4 4 begins, rejoice in the Lord. If you are a child of God anyway, if you are in the Lord, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've become His child, if you've entered into this love relationship with God, if you are in the Lord, you get a choice that I'm not sure is available to everyone. I mean, other people get to maybe choose happiness. They, they get to uh, try to make the most out of their life. Uh, they, they try to bring as much enjoyment to themselves as they possibly can. But when you're a child of God, when you actually have God as your destination and, and God as your companion on the journey, there is something that happens in your life that is special. It's, it's lifting. I, I think of my my oldest and my youngest right now, my oldest daughter, Erica, and my youngest son, Darren, they're in a car and they're on a road trip to Nebraska because last summer, after 20 years of not seeing my grandfather, I got to see him when I was on my sabbatical. And he's in his 90s, mid-90s, and, and uh, in good health, but you can also tell that you know, he's getting up there and there's you know, not many years left. And when I came back from that, I, it's been an emphasis of mine since then to stay in touch with him and also to kind of get my family to meet him, you know, before he dies. And so my daughter, Jenna, got assigned uh, from the University of North Carolina, I'm proudly representing today, uh, to a hospital in eastern Nebraska this summer. So she spent a lot of time with my grandfather, and she has a little place there. And so I sent my other two kids in my Civic to drive out there, stay with Jenna, meet Grandpa, and they are seeing the sights along the way. Yesterday, uh, they were at Old Faithful in Yellowstone. And then they made it last night to Mount Rushmore and then saw the, the face of the mountain all lit up, you know, at night there. So they're seeing the sights, but the ultimate end that they have is to see family. And, and, and on the way, it's family. It's brother and sister together in the car. And I say that this is the difference, I think, between someone who's going through life without God as the destination, without God on board, and somebody who's going through life alone without that kind of sense of purpose, yeah, they get to see the sights. But it's not the same. The joy comes from the Lord. And I would say joy is a transcendent spiritual optimism that is based in eternal realities. There's an eternal reality to our life. There, there's a transcendence to the things that we see here. But we know that there's a bigger story at work than the one that we're looking at. And because of that, we can rejoice. Jenna was visiting a church in Nebraska with my cousin, Tricia. And uh, that church had sent out a youth team, and that team had come back one Sunday, and were giving reports. And there was one big kid, football player. You know, in, in Nebraska, they're corn-fed. I mean, these are, <laughs> these, are, these are some big boys. But this big high school football player was getting up there talking about his experience on this mission trip and said, you know, I didn't... I've always been confused about how I could be like worshiping God all the time. 
And uh, he said he had heard about how in the Bible the angels are worshiping God all the time and how we can be having this life of worship all the time. I, I never could get it, but he said, I likened it to sports, how, you know, you see at, at, at the big play, I mean, the, the winning shot or the last second field goal, you know, the crowd erupts. It's, it's just, it, it's that game winning moment. And, and he said this, having God in your life is like always making the game winning shot. You know, that is how it is. When, when we really start to realize how graced we are to have God in our life, we're always making the game winning shot. We rejoice in the Lord, and you can choose to rejoice in Him all the time. It goes on to say, Rejoice in the Lord always. To get the full impact of this, you've got to understand where Paul was when he wrote this. He's in Rome writing to Philippi, but he's in a prison as well. And many think it was the Mamertine prison that you can still see. You can go to Rome, you can visit this prison. It's dungeon-esque. It's underground. And a hundred years before Paul was put in this prison, one of the Roman historians, Seleust, was writing about this dungeon and said, it is sunk about 12 feet underground. Walls secured on every side and over it is a vaulted roof connected with stone arches. But its appearance is disgusting and horrible by reason of filth, darkness, and stench. Now that is written 2,000 years ago where disgusting and horrible, if you had to say that, it really was disgusting and horrible. I mean, we're in sanitized conditions here, but here we have no sanitation, no lights. Because it's underground, there's water constantly seeping into this prison. They're, they're, the prisoners are just chained to the outside walls. Paul doesn't know, because he's in this prison, whether he's going to come out alive. This particular prison is not just for holding prisoners, it's for executing them too. And in the early parts of Philippians, he says, you know, I don't know what, what to wish for, to live or to die. Because if I die, I'm going to go with Christ. But to live is better for you. He says, I'm torn here. He doesn't know... He's been beaten up, he's chained, he's in this stench hole, and here he writes, rejoice in the Lord, always. I mean, we have choices we can make. No matter what is going on around us, we have choices. And we have these choices to make a positive emotional connection with God. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. There's an exclamation point in my Bible, but it's really not in the original language. There. There are no punctuation marks in Greek, but he used the method that he could to make an impact, and that is repetition. And not only does he repeat it, he calls attention to the fact, I'm repeating this. Here's the exclamation point. Rejoice. Very forceful. Not suggestion. More command. He's saying this is very doable, but he's also saying, let's do this. Let's rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say it again. Rejoice. And Paul anticipates our question, which is how? With a threefold answer. And first he says, by seeing God in everything, everywhere. Verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The first part of this is possible because the last part. You're going through some stuff but you're not alone. And because the Lord is near, you are chill. NIV translates it gentleness. Other translations have moderation. It's really from the, you, the root of yielding. And I think many times we have an expectation of what life will be like for us, and, and we're here, and we're striving, and, and we're disappointed, and we're anxious, and, and we're reaching all the time. And at some point, we yield. And we say, no, the circumstances that God has for me are the ones that I'm in right now. I'm okay with that. And God is with me in these circumstances. And I'm super okay with that. I'm going to chill. You know, what happens when the bill comes in the mail that you weren't expecting? I mean, I know in church we say, I believe in Jesus. I worship Him. He will provide. But when the bill's in your hand, are you chill? Or does anxiety well up 
and you can't sleep that night, and you start to be frantic. I mean, some of us are practical atheists. We're, we're theologically saying we believe there's a God, but practically, if you could just take a video camera and follow us, we don't act like it. And what, what Paul's saying is, hey, this should bleed all the way through. Chill. But when you have that confrontational meeting with your boss, you know, do you come out of there? I mean, obviously, it's not the conversation you wanted. But does this rattle you? Does this take you down? Or can you chill? Let your yieldedness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. There's an old song that had this lyric in it. Joy is the flag flown high on the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. When you know that God is with you, that he who is with you is greater than he who is in the world. When, when you understand that the sovereign God of the universe who just spoke this all into place, that God is on your side. You're chill. You say, yeah, tough things might come, but I've got a God who is greater than all of that. And you can make joy your standard by seeing God in everything and everywhere. Second, by praying through anxieties as they arise. You say, I want to trust God, but Dave, stuff comes up. What do you do with that stuff? And, and Paul says, you give it to God. In verse 6, he goes on, Do not be anxious about anything that comes up, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When stuff comes up, make the exchange. Give him the problem. Let him give you his peace. Offer to him the concern. Let him come back with that sense of confidence that God's going to help you. This peace which passes all understanding, he will give you if you will give him the burden. Peter put it like this, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. I think one of the prayers that we should be praying often is, God, I have a concern. You find out that your kids aren't exactly behaving the way that you taught them the way that you ask them to behave. And I think you bring this to God. Any anxiety, anything that comes up like that, you say, God, I have a concern. I have a concern for my kid. You look at the financial statement and you're going, man, I don't, I'm not quite sure how this works right now. You, you bring this to God. You say, God, I have a concern. You, 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 in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we bring our concerns to him and he then responds with his peace. So we develop this joy-filled life by seeing God in everything, all the time, by praying whenever anything comes up, and then third, by maintaining a grateful perspective. And he concludes this little section by saying, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He's calling to mind all of the many expressions of kindness from God. <laughs> the multitude of, of expressions of his grace. We can see these all around if we're looking for them. And he's saying, don't miss these opportunities. You want to be joyful? You got to be grateful. You, you got to start looking at all the beauty in your world, all the beauty that's in and around you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul picked up on this again in a different book. He said, all this is for your benefit, so that the grace, that's unmerited kindness, unmerited favor from God, that is reaching more and more people, may cause thanksgiving, or I think a better translation would have been gratefulness, to overflow to the glory of God. There's a missed opportunity here in translation because the word grace and the word gratefulness, they, they come from this same root. And God sheds his grace on us and we respond in a grateful manner to him. And I think this is important because we try to define gratitude and you can't really define it except in close relationship to grace. 
You have to understand that you don't deserve what you have. You don't deserve the kindness that's been offered to you. You have been so favored by God. And because of that, we're grateful. John Piper said, gratitude honors God. Gratitude is the echo of grace as it reverberates through the hollows of the human heart. Gratitude is the unashamed acceptance of a free gift and the heartfelt declaration, listen to this, that we cherish what we cannot buy. Therefore, gratitude glorifies the free grace of God and signifies the humility of a needy and receptive heart. Man, when you know that you're a needy and, and, and broken person and you see how God is, is treating you, the kindness that he's showing to you, this echoes in your heart, this, this gratitude. For some of us, the gratitude isn't happening because there's too much pride. And Charles Spurgeon called this out in one of his sermons. He said, proud minds criticize and object, but humble minds glean and receive benefit. I think that's what Paul was trying to say. Philippians 4.8. He's saying, can you glean? Gleaning actually is taking what you can from it and weeding out the rest. I mean, we don't take it all, but we glean benefit. From this circumstance, from these series of events, I'm going to take something from which I can give God glory, from which I can feel blessed, and I can have this reverberate in my heart. Some of you know that just in the last few weeks, I, I was burglarized and haven't had a lot of this happen in my life, but when it happened, it was a good one. I think somebody literally backed a truck up to my garage, <clears throat> and I don't know whether it was overnight or we were just gone, but just about anything that had a cord attached to it, a power drill or a saw or anything like that, they, they took. And a friend of mine was calling shortly after that to commiserate and just kind of, kind of say, man, that really, really sucks. And, and I said, you know, it does, but I am thankful that I had something that could be stolen. I mean, like over the years, God has helped me to buy these tools and I've been able to use them, you know, not very well use them, but you know, um, I'm kind of like Tim, the tool man, Taylor, I big talk, you know, but, uh, and you know, when somebody was looking for stuff, they found me. I have stuff. I'm a blessed man. There's some men maybe in this room who don't have some of the tools that I had. I don't know. Maybe you have better tools than I have. But in any case, I got to thinking about that. And I was thankful. You know, that through the years, God has allowed me to acquire some of these things. And I had insurance. And some people don't have that. And I have friends. One of my friends here in the church backed the pickup truck up here to the side of the church and gave me a compressor and a nailer and all kinds of tools that I have now on loan from him. Tools I didn't have beforehand. Why am I worried? Why am I concerned? I can see the beauty in this. Some of you right now are shopping for school clothes or soon will be for your kids, and, and you're going, man, these kids have grown two sizes this summer. And it's a strain on the budget. And it's taxing. I mean, just because our kids see what other kids have and you're taking them out there and you're going, no, we can't buy that. No, we can't buy that. And... But here's the beautiful thing. You have kids who are growing. And someday you're going to look back and go, gosh, I wish I had the chance to go school shopping with my kids. And you're upset and you're concerned, but you're missing. You're missing out on this glorious, wonderful time that you have with these kids. I was talking with one of our families this last week, and they had to put a dog down. The dog was 14 years old. It was a shepherd. And they had bought it in Florida in a, in a pet shop. They had gone back many, many times to look at this dog. It was priced too high. The price came down. The price came down. The kids were saving if they could save up half, mom and dad would match half. 
Finally, the price got down where it hit the halfway mark of what the kids had saved. They bought this dog. And they drove with this dog all the way from Florida to Washington in their car. And this dog, as they were describing it to me, just had a sixth sense about anybody's feelings. The the boys, after a, a bad football practice or whatever, would come in upset, and this dog would come right over and put his head right on, on, on their leg or on their lap. And he just had a sense if mom had a hard day, dog would crawl into bed with mom. You know, for years, they had this experience with this dog, and then this dog got to a point where it couldn't make it anymore, and they had to put the dog down. And I met with the husband the day after, and he was hurting still. And I said to him, you know what makes it so hard is it was so good. You had a great animal. You had a great pet. That makes it really tough. And a lot of times, the things that are so hard in life are because they were so beautiful. I mean, look what God did. And now we're missing it. And even in our sorrow, we can have joy. I fly a lot, a lot more than I ever thought I would. And and sometimes it's a pain. You know, going through these scanning machines, taking off your shoes, taking off your belt, taking your laptop out, taking all your little tiny three ounce. I don't know how I'm going to blow something up with this, but you know, just in case, you know. And, uh, but then I think about the places I've been able to go. Places that a lot of people would dream about going. And places I get to fly to that other people can't afford to fly to, so they drive there or they take a bus there. And sometimes I think we just don't see how favored we are. This building next door to us, it's a challenge. I'm I'm not going to lie. It's a challenge. It's probably the foremost challenge in my ministry so far. You know, there have been some sleepless nights, and uh, and, and it, it scares me. But I also think about pastors across the country who would go, man, are you kidding me? You're going to be on a freeway exit with that kind of facility and that kind of visibility? I mean, we have a bunch of people in this room who are not connected, and it burdens me as a pastor. But do you see what the problem is? We've got a bunch of people here who are not connected. But that's a problem I'll take. I mean, we've got a community here that needs Christ, and there's so many needs in it, but I'm going, wow, God's given us a vision to not just be a blessing to Skagit County, but for Skagit County to be a blessing to the world. Think about this. We get to rejoice in all of this. I had my annual checkup. Actually, I had missed a year, so it was two years since I'd had my last physical. And, you know, I turned my head and coughed. And, and then the, the doctor got the rubber gloves out. And that's, you know, that's one of the worst sounds a man can ever hear is that thwack. But he thwacked the rubber glove. And... Uh, And then he informed me, because I'm turning 50, he goes, yeah, next year you'll start to get the full meal deal. I'm like, okay, describe that to me. Because I wasn't having a good time. And uh, I don't think he really was either, actually. But (laughs) never mind, forget that. We just got (laughs) to... We got to move on quickly. But, uh, But, you know, I'm going through this, and then it occurs to me, I have a doctor. I have a doctor. I mean, for 25 years, this man has been my doctor. And I get a checkup. You know, and if cancer starts to come, he's going to be all over this. There are people in this world who when cancer comes, it just ravages their body straight away, and they're gone. You think about this. We have doctors. We have medicine. I had a friend this last week who was telling me about how he had hurt his back and, and then his, he, he, his, hurt, his back hurt so bad, his wife had to help him in the morning put his pants on. And she was super cool about it and it was somewhat humbling for him, but he was thankful for his wife, just the care she showed. And it reminded him of a friend of his who's paralyzed, lives in another state, 
And he got to thinking not just about his friend, but his friend's wife. And how through the time that he's been paralyzed, she has taken care of him. And he called his friend up and said to him, I'm going shopping for a piece of jewelry for your wife that I'd like you to give to her. And his friend, who's wheelchair bound on the other end, began to sob on the phone. I mean, I'm telling you, there's some special things happening around us, some special people doing special things and, and special gifts being given. And my friend hurt his back. And through that, it took him to another level of gratefulness. You know, I think all of us can get to another level of gratefulness. And, and Paul says, think on these things. You, you can change your mind. You need to change your mind. You can change your perspective, and you need to. There, there's this little saying, nobody knows who came up with this, but a lot of people quote it, I was worried about not having shoes until I saw a man with no feet. I think this is also growing in faith. Sometimes growing in faith means we are reaching for something we don't have. Sometimes growing in faith is receiving, getting what we've already been given. And saying, thank you, God. Thank you for all of this. Grateful people are happy people. In fact, I think it's impossible to be happy and to be ungrateful. Ungrateful people make bad bosses, make bad employees, make bad husbands, make bad wives, make bad parents. Ungrateful people make bad kids. Ungrateful people make bad pastors. Ungrateful people make bad Christians. In fact, there's no role you can think of that can't be made worse by being ungrateful. And there's no role that we can have that can be made better, it can't be made better by being grateful. I think one of the prayers that we need to just be praying all the time is, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know how the scripture says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why? Because we don't praise him enough. He's been so good to us. And we need to do that. This is something that I don't think comes naturally. I think we have to purposefully stop sometimes and go, wait a minute. What am I missing here? We've got to think on these things. Andy Andrews wrote a book called the, the Seven Decisions, Understanding the Keys to Personal Success. And the fifth decision in his book is the joyful decision. And he, he writes this. Think about it. You can be grateful for the taxes you pay. That means you're earning money. You can be grateful for the mess you have to clean up after a party because it means you are surrounded by friends. You can be grateful for the nice clothes you're wearing. I would imagine there are some people in the world who don't have any clothes at all. And if they fit a little too tightly, it means you have enough to eat. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. You can be grateful for mowing your lawn. You can be grateful for the windows that need to be cleaned, the gutters that are stopped up, that lock you haven't gotten around to fixing. In fact, you can be grateful for all the things that are wrong with your house. Why? You have a house. You want something to be grateful for? Walk into your bathroom, turn on the faucet, and watch that clean water come out. Let it run over your hand as long as you want that clean water. It's available in your own bathroom, from your own faucet. We're pouring this clean water on our lawns and washing our cars and dogs. You can be grateful for aching muscles at the end of the day. You're able to work. And you can be so grateful for that loud alarm clock that goes off before daylight every morning. If you heard it, it means you're alive. I want to urge you to condition yourself on a daily basis to find things to be grateful for. Become the possessor of a grateful spirit. I think this means you're going to have to ignore your conditioning, some of you. Because some of you have been conditioned to be negative. Uh, maybe it's your temperament. You, you just notice what's wrong. I, I sometimes struggle here. I'm, I'm trying to, to see God bring something about. I'm trying to cooperate with Him in this. And, and I sometimes see where things are at and where they could go. And, 
and I, I forget to appreciate where things are at. The goodness that's already here amongst us. And so sometimes we have to work against our temperament, our conditioning. Sometimes there's a tremendous amount of conditioning that has gone on. And we have to break that. We have, we have to flip over. As a Christian, we don't get to be that way anymore. We have to choose joy. You know how the standard rail gauge in the U.S. is the distance between the two rails. It's four feet, eight and a half inches. And you go, well, that's an odd number. How do we get that? Well, that was the railroad size in England. And so the English rail builders brought over this dimension, four feet, eight and a half inches, to, to America. And that's become the standard rail gauge. Well, how did they come up with that back there? Well, that was the width of the tramways in England that they had first made down through the roads. You know, the, the, the tramways became the same size as the railways across country. And you say, well, how do those tramways get to be four feet, eight and a half inches? Well, that was the width of the wagon wheels that had run down those same paths. The wagon in England had been four feet, eight and a half inches. You say, well, why did the wagon wheels, why were they four feet, eight and a half inches? Well, because that was the ruts. The ruts were four feet, eight and a half inches, and they didn't want to break the wagon wheels, so they measured the ruts and said, let's go with the ruts. So we say, well, where did the ruts come from? Some of the ruts came back to ancient Rome. Those were war chariots that had run through those alleyways and streets. And, and those war chariots, those Roman war chariots, the, the width was four feet, eight and a half inches. You say, well, why were the Roman chariots four feet, eight and a half inches? It's the width of two horses behinds, basically. So now when you say, well, what kind of a horse's rear end made that decision? You know <laughs> where it comes from. Decisions have been made based on the horse's rear end. And uh, one of the most advanced transportation systems in the world was the space shuttle. And even the space shuttle was constricted by this dimension because they built the booster rockets in Utah and they had to bring them across the country by rail. And they had to go through mountains, through tunnels that were a little bit bigger than four feet, eight and a half inches. And so they wanted to build bigger boosters. They couldn't, they were constricted, which is why they had to have two of them so they could get them through the tunnels. And all of this goes back to ancient Rome, the conditioning. Some of you are going, you know, my dad's so negative, my mom's so negative, my grandparents were negative. Shoot, my ethnicity asked me to be negative. And I'm saying, you've got to get out of that rut. It's time. It's time to set a new pattern for future generations, a pattern of gratitude. Let's bow for prayer.